Well, you uh, you bring up resources and and uh, schools that might be overwhelmed by certain problems. Um, that's a good segue into my next question. During the Republic, Republican presidential primary debates, uh, there were many candidates who talked about abolishing the Department of Education. I think it was one of the departments that Rick Perry actually remembered uh, in his three. <laughs> um, you know, if what is the right role? Is there a role for the Department of Education? Is it necessary? Um, and what's the right role for it in education in ailing some of the problems that these schools can't fix themselves? The uh, abolishing of the Department of Education has been a favorite uh, theme of Republicans for a very long period of time, and it has to do with the very strong feeling on the part of many Republicans that it really ought to be the states and not the federal government that is that are responsible uh, for educating students. Uh, it's a part of a broader issue of federal versus state control uh, in the on the part of, of conservatives in the Republican Party. Uh, my feeling is that the Department of Education is here to stay. Uh, the question of their role, uh, particularly their question, the question of the degree to which uh, they contribute or the federal government contributes to the funding of public schooling uh, is at issue. Uh, I think you know that the funding uh, formula at the moment is that roughly 45 percent of, of uh, school aid is supplied by local districts. 45% is supplied by states and only 10% is supplied by the federal government. The federal government has succeeded in leveraging that 10% remarkably. Uh, that started through the No Child Left Behind uh, regulations, which required states and local school districts to jump through a whole range of hoops uh, for a very small amount of money. Uh, the same was true of the Race to the Top, where major, major uh, education reforms uh, were encouraged by what is a large amount of money, but in terms of the state budgets for education is a piddling amount uh, of contribution, and yet changes were made uh, as the result of that. Do, do we know enough yet, do we have enough information to start to evaluate how the Race to the Top program is coming along? I know it's catalyzed a lot of activity in the states, um, but has there been any uh, you know, preliminary data? No. I don't think so. Uh, I think the most important change that was brought about by the Race to the Top was the adoption of the Common Core State Standards. Uh, as you know, the Common Core State Standards were initiated before the Race to the Top began, uh, but Race to the Top gave extra credit to states that adopted the Common Core State Standards. Uh, most states have adopted them, and two consortia are involved in creating assessments that go along with those standards. Uh, many districts and states have adopted the standards and are actually in the process of implementing them. Uh, nobody has adopted the assessments because they're not finished and as a result of that we don't have any student performance results back. Um, in terms of the other race to the top uh, provisions, again I think it's too soon to make a judgment as to their success or failure. Well you bring up Common Core state standards. Uh, the next step uh, one would think is, is, is national standards. Uh, What's your view on, on national standards? It, you know, is it a problem that you know, math in Boston can seemingly be different than, than math in Houston? I think the reason, if, you would, if we'd had this conversation four years ago and we had been talking about the possibility of having a common set of uh, standards, whether national or federal, uh, I would have said it's way beyond uh, the possibility, realm of possibility. And yet, four years later, it's in place. And I think the reason it's in place is that it was put together by the Council of uh, Governors rather than the, uh, rather than the federal government. Uh, moving beyond that, the, the disadvantage of the Common Core state standards is that they're voluntary. Uh, and a state, for example, Texas and Alaska have opted out of the uh, of the Common Core state standards, and presumably any other state uh, that found them dysfunctional for whatever reason. Uh, clearly, they're stiffer than most state standards, and as a result of that, the first assessments that come down the pike are going to mean that student performance in almost every state drops rather than rising. That's going to be a jolt, and one of the reactions to that jolt would be that a state legislature or a governor could simply drop out of the state standards, and there's no uh, penalty for doing that. Federal standards would prevent that from happening. But federal standards would again uh, encounter a large resistance from those who really believe that education is a state function, not a federal federal function. 
Well, spe speaking of state functions, the last thing I, I want to segue into uh, are, are new ideas uh, uh, for education reform. One of the things we've seen over the past decade is is the evolution of charter schools um, uh, to a great degree uh, in some areas. Uh, are charter schools just, just a band-aid to the problem, or are they part of an overall solution? I don't think you can generalize about charter schools. Uh, people tend to say, are charter schools good or bad? Are ch charter schools better or worse than uh, typical public schools, traditional public schools? I don't think it's possible to make that kind of a generalization, because we have very good charter schools and we have very bad uh, charter schools, and they tend to be lumped together. Uh, the very good charter schools are taking advantage of what charters are able to do, which is to experiment without the dead hand of bureaucracy uh, preventing them from doing that, and presumably allowing traditional public schools to copy the successful experiments of uh, charter schools. I don't think they're a panacea, but I don't think they're a band-aid. Well, staying on the topic of, of, of different types of, of schools, some more radical reformers and some students I've talked to here at Yale uh, feel that private schools are a huge obstacle to, to public school reform. Do you think that's, uh, that argument has merit? Or do private schools draw away some urgency uh, you know, from lawmakers who have students uh, in private schools? President Obama's kids both go to um, a private school in uh, DCs. Only for wealthy parents, and the total population of independent schools in the United States is somewhere around 10 percent of all students, and it's not likely to grow very much uh, because of the cost of tuition. Tuition in independent schools at this point is astronomical. Uh, it looks like college tuition uh, used to look just a few years ago, and so it's not likely to, uh, to make much of an effect. Um, I think that the, the one area that we haven't talked about that is important to think about is virtual schools. Uh, very many uh, states and some districts are beginning to create schools in which most of the instruction, or in some cases all of the instruction, happens virtually rather than in an actual classroom. Uh, probably the best version of that is something called blended learning where a part of it is virtual, but there are teachers involved uh, to guide students along the, uh, the way as they're doing, engaging in that. I think that it's likely it could turn education on its head. I think one of the things that is interesting is that if I were to walk into a classroom today, it would look very much like the picture on that wall, uh, which is very much like a classroom in which I experienced my uh, elementary school and a junior high school and a high school education. Uh, the seats are all faced in one direction, the teacher is in the front, uh, the teacher is uh, offering the instruction and the students are theoretically learning. I think that virtual schools and blended learning uh, flip or, op or offer the opportunity to, to flip the classroom in such a way that students are doing the work rather than simply being preached at. Well, that continues with with the theme of, of, of new ideas. There seems to be a third movement outside of reform establishment that is crying foul over the loss of creativity uh, and, and imagination schools, and that because our school system was designed in the Industrial Revolution, that we are still in this outdated system of churning out students like we're in a factory. Uh, what can we do to, you know, creativity is hard to quantify. What can we do to inject you know, more creativity uh, and more freedom in schools for students. Well, I think the major problem or the major shift in this direction, excuse me, was brought about in uh, the year 2000 by the uh, No Child Left Behind law, uh, which because of its emphasis on reading, on math, and on science, uh, emphasizes those to the exclusion of almost anything else that goes on in, in schooling. Now, mind you, uh, people need a basic literacy and a basic numeracy in order to function in, in the world, and you can't go farther in your education unless you've got those basic skills. But the problem is it holds down the people for whom acquiring those skills uh, is easy because of what they brought into the classroom from their home when they entered kindergarten. Uh, what, is, what is needed uh, is a continued emphasis for the people who have not yet acquired literacy and numeracy to acquire those skills, while at the same time allowing those who have acquired those skills uh, to move beyond and inject elements of creativity uh, into their education. Well, keeping on this, my last you know, policy-related question is, is still on creative ideas for school reform. Uh, if you look at early childhood education, there have been a lot of studies that have shown 
that if a, a student, you know, falls behind in early childhood education or doesn't receive it as compared to a, another student, uh, that once you get past maybe second grade, there's just no catching up. Uh, do we place too little emphasis on early childhood education? Should Head Start be expanded? Should there be national mandates or funded programs? Yes and yes. Uh, we, sh we should certainly encourage uh, early childhood education. The results are not quite as clear-cut as you suggested a minute ago. Uh, in some instances, uh, studies have suggested that there is a carryover effect that lasts into the early elementary grades, but does, does not carry over into the later elementary uh, grades, junior high school and high school. Nonetheless, uh, it, it's certainly that effect uh, on kids in first grade, in second grade, in third grade uh, is, is very significant and it really would be important to increase uh, early childhood education, particularly in urban school districts. All right, John Bryan Starr, your ideal Secretary of Education, who is it? Randy Weingarten. <laughs> okay. uh, I, think that, uh, I think that Obama has a, uh, an issue right at the moment uh, because if I were he, I would not want to go through uh, another confirmation process around the issue of education. I would keep uh, Arne Duncan. Arne Duncan in place. They get along well, they uh, see eye to eye with respect to their policies, and if Duncan were willing to stay, in the first place they could play bas basketball, and in the second place uh, he wouldn't face major uh, discussion within the Senate uh, with respect to education policy uh, that he probably doesn't need right at this point. Now, you're Secretary of Education. We're making you Secretary of Education today and you have a magic wand, what is the first thing that you change, first thing that you fix? I'd focus back on the issue that we started this conversation with, and that is uh, teacher recruitment, teacher preparation, teacher evaluation. I really would, uh, and this is not a major shift from what's been going on in the Obama administration, but I really would emphasize doing everything possible uh, to improve the intake uh, of high quality uh, people to become teachers. I would improve the quality of teacher preparation programs across the board uh, and I would then continue to improve our methods for evaluating their performance once they got into uh, classrooms. Well finally there are there are Yale students who are watching this who are probably interested in education. What's the best way for them to get involved and make the biggest impact? Is it you know getting involved in New Haven, Teach for America, break through these types of programs? All of the above. Uh, I think that uh, this is a unique opportunity that Yale has because of the depth of the involvement of the university, its students, and its student organizations in volunteer work in a very interesting and, at this point, I believe, promising school district, namely uh, New Haven. I think Teach for America is a wonderful opportunity for those who are able to, to get uh, into it. I think that uh, there are any number of internships uh, which my former students have been involved in uh, which take them into the realm of education policy work. Um, there's, there's a myriad of opportunities both in the classroom and outside of the classroom uh, for people to become involved. The one point I do make to students is that if you're interested in uh, education policy, you're likely to be taken much more seriously if you've actually had some on the ground experience in the classroom. And as a result, volunteering uh, are one of these uh, alternative uh, accreditation programs like TFA uh, is a good way to begin. Dr. John Brandstar, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Uh, and thank you for watching. My name is Cody Pomerantz and this is YDN Multimedia.